With all that said, I want to welcome Courtney um, to the webinar today. She works for Shaw Rosenthal, and Shaw actually authors one of our HR manuals um, in Maryland. And we've been working with them for a really long time. And uh, the newest edition of the Maryland Human Resources Manual comes out in January. So if you're interested in that, um, you can go to our website for more information. But we're so happy to have Courtney here today. She's really experienced um, employment law attorney. Courtney represents employers with regard to a wide range of labor and employment matters in court and before federal and state agencies. She also prepares and revises employee handbooks personnel policies and employment agreements. And there's lots more, but for the sake of time, I'm just gonna leave it there and turn it over to you, Courtney. Perfect. I will stop sharing my screen so you can. All righty, let me get this. Take your time. Yeah, all right. All right, you can see the PowerPoint presentation there, right? Yep, looks great. Perfect. Um, all right, well, thank you um, so much, Amy, for that introduction. Um, as she mentioned, I am an attorney at um, Shaw Rosenthal in Baltimore, Maryland. We are a management side employment um, law firm, um, uh, boutique law firm in Baltimore. So representing um, largely management in um, a large variety of labor and employment law um, issues and disputes um, and litigation, and of course, advice and counsel as well. Um, so, let me just... okay, just a little housekeeping um, before we get started. Um, the materials presented in this seminar are for informational purposes only and not for the purpose of providing legal advice. You should, of course, contact your attorney to obtain advice with respect to any particular issue or problem. Um, participation in this seminar does not create an attorney-client relationship between the participant and Shaw Rosenthal, um, and the opinions expressed in this seminar are the opinions of the individual presenters only and may not reflect the opinions of the firm or any other individual attorney at the firm. Okay, so um, today I'm going to be talking about um, employment law issues related to managing a remote workforce. Um, obviously, some form of remote work existed um, before the pandemic, um, but we saw um, a, a pretty uh, swift and significant change in response to the COVID-19 pandemic back in uh, March of 2020, which is crazy to think about that almost being three years ago. Um, at this point, some employers have returned fully in person, others have not. Um, as restrictions began to lift in many states, some major companies, including Citigroup and Twitter and Facebook, have said that full or hybrid telework will be a permanent option moving forward as a perk to attract competitive workers. And I know here at Shaw Rosenthal, I actually just had a conversation a week or two ago with a client who was um, considering a more permanent distributed workforce model. And so we were discussing, um, you know, all of the, um, you know, the implications that would come with that and the things they need to be thinking about if that's what um, the type of model they want to employ going forward. And so that's the purpose of today's presentation. Um, we're going to be talking briefly about the shift to remote work and why people prefer it. I'm going to talk about some demographic trends in remote work. And then the bulk of the presentation will be discussing some legal implications of remote work, some state specific requirements, and then best practices for managing a remote workforce. Oops. All right. So why do people prefer to work from home? Um, obviously, some workplaces are, um, are still closed or unavailable, but even where workplaces have reopened, people are continuing to work from home um, for a number of reasons. Um, a lot are reporting that it creates a better work-life balance um, and that it makes it easier to get work done and meet deadlines. For example, um, among adults, um, among employed adults whose job can be done from home and who are currently working from home at least some of the time, but rarely or never did before the pandemic, 64% say that working from home has made it easier to balance work and their personal life. Um, two in 10 of these adults say balancing work and their personal life is about the same, and 16% say that it's actually harder. 
fewer are um, citing concerns about being exposed to the coronavirus as a major reason for why they're currently working from home, 40, about 42% now versus 57% in 2020. Um, more are saying that a preference for working from home is a major reason why they're doing so, around 67% now versus 60% in 2020. And there's also been a significant increase since 2020 from 9% to 17% in people saying that, that the fact that they've relocated away from the area where they work is a major reason why they are currently teleworking. However, some workers prefer to work from, um, from the office for increased productivity. Um, six in 10 workers say that a major reason they rarely or never work from home is that they prefer working at their workplace and a similar share, around 61%, cite feeling more productive at their workplace as a major reason. Um, relatively few people are saying that they prefer to work in person rather than at home because they don't have the proper space or resources at home or because they think that there are more advancement opportunities if they show their face in the office rather than working from home or that they feel the pressure from management or from coworkers to be present in the office. Studies are also showing that employee preference um, differs based on social identifiers as well. So um, black and Hispanic workers are more likely than white workers to express at least some concern about being exposed to the coronavirus at work. Um, but black workers are particularly concerned. 42% say, say that they are very concerned about COVID-19 exposure compared with 24% of Hispanic workers and an even smaller share of white workers at 14%. Um, concerns about COVID-19 exposure at work also vary by gender, age, and income. So women are more likely than men to say that they are concerned about being exposed to the coronavirus from the people that they interact with at work. Um, and interestingly, a majority of younger workers, or I'm sorry, workers younger than 30, around 60%, express at least some concern compared with 52% of those aged 30 to 49, 47% of those aged 50 to 64, and around 44% of those aged 65 or older. Um, and then workers with lower incomes are more likely than those with middle and upper incomes to say that they are concerned about being exposed to COVID-19. There's also, um, uh, a digital divide that impacts um, not only a preference for that folks have to work from home, but the ability to work from home as well. Um, roughly a quarter of adults with household incomes below thirty thousand dollars a year say they don't own a smartphone. Smart phone, excuse me, and about four in 10 adults with lower incomes do not have home broadband services or a desktop or laptop, laptop computer. Um, a majority of Americans with lower incomes are also not tablet owners. By comparison, each of these technologies is nearly ubiquitous among adults in households earning $100,000 or more a year. Um, Americans with higher household incomes are also more likely to have multiple devices that enable them to go online. Okay, and so we come now to the question of the hour. Um, what should employers consider when managing a remote workforce? So as you can see um, from this slide, there are a number of considerations, both general and legal, ranging from compliance with wage and hour laws um, and anti-discrimination laws, um, restrictive covenants, paid sick and family leave requirements. Um, and as Amy mentioned briefly at the beginning of this presentation, it would be um, you know, impossible to do a deep dive on each of these um, in the one hour time frame that we have today. Um, but I'm going to at least touch upon each of these briefly so that you're aware of the types of issues that you should be thinking about, um, you know, either currently managing a remote workforce or if you're considering implementing a more um, uh, permanent hybrid or remote workforce.
All right, so this may seem a bit um, self-explanatory, um, but although employers with hybrid or remote, or remote work policies can help attract and retain top talent, it can also affect employers' state-specific obligation depending on where their employees are located. Therefore, it is critically important to know where your employees perform work um, so that you can be complying with the various state-specific laws. Um, it's also important to put protections in place to ensure that your employees are working from where they say they're going to be working. Um, and that's something we'll um, discuss later on um, when we talk about um, best practices and tips. Um, another important consideration um, is how to maintain a culture of collaboration and collegiality while working remotely. I know that's something that even within my own law firm, we've, we've talked a lot about um, over the course of the past three years. Um, so before the pandemic, very few remote capable employees worked exclusively from home. But then the pandemic hit and a lot of people were forced to work um, exclusively from home. And even now, if we fast forward to 2022, most employees who um, have the capacity to work from home have continued to work from home at least part of the time. Um, the mix has become a bit of a split um, with you know, half working a hybrid schedule and half working entirely from, from home. And typically, you know, leaders management want to honor this fle the flexibility that employers desire, but are concerned about sustaining team performance and culture if team members work uh, primarily from home in the long term. And so some ideas for addressing this, um, this concern could include in person retreats, whether company wide or team wide core in person days. So I know um, I work with clients who um, have have mandated that you know everybody needs to be in the office on Wednesdays or you know each team the, the legal department gets to decide what day of the week but you're everybody's in the office the same one or two days per week um also regular all hands video conference meetings are an option um and also you know to the extent that it's possible um you know, get, allowing people to have the opportunity to interact outside of work, whether that be social events, happy hours. Um, my firm just recently did, you know, uh, went to an axe throwing place and we all did that together. And it was, it was really fun. And it's, it's nice to spend some time um, outside of work with your coworkers. We're also seeing um, a lot of people experiencing really frayed mental health. Um, you know, people have a lot going on, obviously, not only the, the pandemic, but childcare obligations, taking care of maybe, you know, um, parents or elderly folks in your life, maybe juggle, juggling multiple types of jobs. Um, and, you know, throughout the pandemic, because we were all at home, especially early on. Um, we couldn't go anywhere. There was nothing else to do. A lot of people just sat down and, you know, opened their laptop and just worked all day and didn't really create that balance between work and personal downtime. Um, and so people are really feeling fatigued and a, a sense of, of overwhelm. Um, and we're seeing this response take on all different kinds of labels, including quiet quitting or what older millennials call the anti-hustle culture. Um, quiet quitting is a term that spread virally um, on social media um, somewhat recently, and it refers to the notion that you know people are refusing to go above and beyond at their job and basically just doing doing what they need to do to get by, just meeting the basic um, elements of their job description. Um, and this is obviously a problem because you know, most jobs today require at least some level of extra effort, whether that be to collaborate with coworkers or to meet customer needs. Um, and so, you know, what can we do to avoid this type of response? Well, you know, managers should learn how to have conversations to help um, employees reduce disengagement and burnout. Um, managers also need to create accountability for individual performance and team collaboration and customer value. Um, another important factor is, you know, employee, employees um, should be able to see how their work contributes to the organization's greater purpose. Um, to fight this notion of kind of burnout and quiet quitting, many companies in 2021 also started offering mental health days for employees. However, questions are now arising about how these days will be counted. For example, are we going to be compensating workers for these days? How many days should employees be given? And over what period of time should we continue to provide this type of leave? Um, 
Another issue is that a request for a mental health day could trigger an ADA discussion. Um, However, the mayor, the mayor request for a mental health day is unlikely to trigger such a request without more, but if an employee discloses more information about their mental health, it's, you know, that's entirely possible. Um, the better approach here would be to give two to three personal or wellness days, which an employee can use without needing to link it, needing to link the time off to their mental health. Um, the pandemic obviously also increased the demand for technological needs, which both exacerbated the creation of positions to facilitate those technologies, as well as requests for training to obtain the skills to use those technologies. So moving forward to the extent that employers want to continue um, either a hybrid or fully remote uh, models, um, you know, we need to make sure that we're successfully navigating training issues pertaining to those technologies. Um, and I really see that training as being two, twofold. So in one sense, providing skills training to make sure that um, remote employees are aware of the technologies available and how to use them, but also making sure that um, your normal, normal cyber, cyber security procedures have been adopted for a remote work environment and that employers are being, employees, excuse me, are being trained on what those requirements and expectations are. Um, remote work also has a number of implications under wage and hour laws. So employers should be aware of state laws regarding wage and hour concerns in the jurisdiction where their employee performs um, their work. Um, employers must comply with state specific overtime, minimum wage, timing of pay periods and paycheck disclosure requirements. Um, and the failure to comply with these requirements may result in um, wage and hour claims from employees. So for example, um, several states have laws governing the timing of a final paycheck or whether or not PTO must be paid out. Um, states also have different laws governing the method and timing of paychecks, particularly for non-exempt workers. Um, for example, like in Maryland, you cannot mandate that employees use direct deposit. Um, uh, State laws regarding exemptions um, also vary from federal exemptions in some situations. So it's really important to ensure that your employees are you know, properly classified and paid correctly. Um, Non-remote, I'm sorry, non-exempt remote employees in particular present a difficult uh, challenge for um, employers. So under the FLSA, employers are required to track non-exempt employees' time. Um, should litigation ensue and the employer not have the records, it's really difficult to defend such claims. Um, and we've actually seen an uptick in um, overtime claims from remote non-exempt um, employees um, over the past few years. Um, you know, now that folks are working from home, they don't have management kind of hanging over their shoulder, um, you know, monitoring when they're coming and going. Um, as I mentioned previously, folks are more likely to, to work longer hours for a number of reasons. So a lot of people are doing a lot of, a lot more work off the clock, um, um, you know, maybe to, to meet productivity goals, for example. Um, so it's really important to be aware of that, to make sure that um, you have the procedures in place so that non-exempt remote employees um, are, you know, clocking in and clocking out appropriately. There are a lot of technologies out there that can help employers with that. Um, it's also important to have, um, you know, overtime policies in place um, that informs employees that they could be disciplined for, um, you know, unauthorized um, overtime. Um, Another issue to keep in mind is that some states require um, meal and rest breaks. So um, to the extent that you have employees performing work remotely in those states, you need to make sure that you are complying with those requirements as well. Um, another big topic of discussion recently um, in connection with remote work has been the rise of Bossware, um, which is tracking software used to monitor keystrokes, take screenshots, activate webcams or mics, or log how much time em employees spend in apps or websites. Um, in one survey, survey, as many as 60% of employers reported using some kind of tracking software to monitor their employees. Um, generally, there's 
not many employer employee protections in this area. However, some states such as New York, Connecticut, and Del Delaware require notice to employees if employers are using such technology. Um, also, um, uh, I think late last month in October, the general counsel of the NLRB um, issued a memo addressing this type of software and encouraging the board to take action to protect employees against these types of practices, which might interfere with um, employees section seven rights. So, um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see more discussion or guidance um, uh, in with respect to this topic in particular. Um, interestingly, I recently listened to um, a New York Times podcast that discussed um, uh, employer surveillance in the workplace and talked about these types of activities and um, employees are definitely, you know, wisening up to these tactics that employers are, are, are implementing and um, I think particularly in over TikTok, um, folks are talking a lot about um, steps that they're taking to counteract this type of technology. So um, people are going online and buying um, a mouse jiggler, which is you know something that you hook up to your computer that makes your your mouse pad vibrate, so it looks like you're you're never inactive. So you can get up, go get a coffee, go walk your dog, do what you might need to do for five or ten minutes, and it's still going to be recording you as being in front of your computer because your, your mouse is kind of wiggling back and forth. Um, so um, that was a really, really interesting listen. In, listen. Um, I encourage anyone who's who's interested to check that out. Um, it talked a lot, a lot about kind of the implications of the rise of this type of software. Um, all right, so also uh, keep in mind that anti-discrimination laws vary by state and locality, um, which means that remote employees could subject um, employers to state-specific anti-discrimination laws and requirements. Um, for example, some states or localities offer protection beyond categories in Title VII, such as marital status, housing status, political affiliation, and personal appearance, just to name a very few. Um, some states also expand protections to interns and independent contractors in addition to employees. Um, and some states also have um, uh, specific requirements with respect to handbook policies um, and require that there be certain policies and that certain policies be um, either posted and or distributed to employees. So it's critically important to consult with counsel on the scope of your operations to ensure that your um, policies and procedures comply with relevant law. Um, some states are now also requiring um, mandatory anti-harassment training. For example, New York City and New York State both require um, mandatory sexual harassment training. And um, these laws can be very broad. Um, so the FAQs pertaining to the New York City law provide that the training requirement applies to um, employees who frequently work in New York City, even if the employer isn't based in New York City, and potentially to employees who aren't physically in the city, but regularly interact with employees who are based in the city. So just something else um, to, to be aware of um, if you have employees working remotely in these states or, or are considering allowing employees to work remotely in these states. Um, Another consideration for employers considering full-time remote or hybrid work is how does remote work impact our DEI efforts in the workplace? Um, so D some employers are you know, very invested in DEI initiatives and implement them in their company. Um, however, DEI outcomes are different in the hybrid or remote format. Um, the remote structure may adversely affect groups like women and traditionally underrepresented economic and racial minorities who prefer hybrid options. Um, so if employers are resistant to those you know, hybrid or remote options, they may actually be undercutting their DEI initiatives in favor of those who want to return to the office. And this can result in disparate impact or disparate disparate treatment, especially if um, the presence presence in the office is, um, is a factor that will be considered for um, promotional opportunities. That said, however, um, 
you know, hybrid and remote options may be beneficial in, in attracting some of these same groups. Um, many women express a particularly strong desire for flexible work arrangements to help deal with the particular challenge of balancing childcare schedules with commuting. Um, in addition, commuting poses a significant and often literal barrier to many, um, many people who have some form of disability. Um, so remote working can enable them to integrate into the organization and contribute more easily, particularly those whose homes have already been adapted to accommodate to their needs. Also, many workers end up being effectively excluded from job opportunities simply because they can't afford to live within reasonable commuting distance from the office. So this makes the location of one's home an implicit qualification for employment and creates hiring barriers for workers in many de demographic groups, especially marginalized populations and minorities. All right, so moving along to reasonable accommodations under the ADA, what's an employer's obligation to provide obligation, um, sorry, to provide accommodations to employees working from home? That obligation is the same as if the employee was working from your physical location. So you must engage in the interactive process and provide reasonable accommodations to allow employees to perform the essential functions of the job or to enjoy equal privileges and benefits of work unless doing so imposes an undue burden. Um, as workplaces have re reopened, we've received um, here at Shaw Rosenthal multiple inquiries from clients related to employees who are requesting to continue working from home as a reasonable accommodation. Um, and telework can absolutely be a reasonable accommodation under some circumstances. However, an employer need not automatically grant telework as a reasonable accommod accommodation, even though it allowed employees to work remotely in response to COVID. Um, the EEOC has said that if there is a disability related limitation, but the employer can effectively address the need with another form of reasonable accommodation at the workplace, then the employer can choose that alternative to telework. Um, as I'm sure we all know, employees you know, are not entitled to the accommodation of their choice if there's another accommodation available. Um, in addition, a request to continue teleworking after a workplace reopens um, as a form of a reasonable accommodation does not have to be granted if it requires continuing to excuse the employee from performing an essential function. Um, so the fact that an employer temporarily excused performance of one or more essential functions when it closed the workplace and enabled employees to telework for the purpose of protecting their safety from COVID-19 or otherwise chose to permit telework um, does not mean that the employer permanently changed a job's essential functions, that telework is always a feasible accommodation or that it does not pose an undue hardship. These are always fact specific determinations. That said, however, um, the EEOC guidance on this issue also says that the temporary telework experience during the COVID-19 pandemic could be relevant to considering a renewed request um, to work remotely. Um, and so the EEOC, EEOC has said that the period um, that we provide, the period of providing telework because of COVID-19 could, could have served as a sort of trial period that showed whether or not a particular employee with a disability was able to perform all of their essential functions while working remotely, and that employers should consider this um, or should consider any uh, new requests in light of this information that was you know, acquired during the you know, trial period of working remotely during COVID. Um, I think the bottom line here is that, you know, because um, a lot of us worked from home uh, remotely during COVID full time and were able to, you know, do a good job and get our jobs done. Um, I think it's going to become harder to argue that telework is not a reasonable accommodation or to prove that telework is an undue hardship um, in the post-pandemic universe than it was pre-pandemic. Um, I also think um, you know there's going to there might be a bit of a difference between employers who have returned full time to the office versus those who um, still have some sort of hybrid. Um, model. Um, so for example, if you know you require employees to come in one day a week, but they're allowed to work from home four days a week, you know, it, it might be a little harder to argue that the employee really needs to be in the office that one day. Um, 
and can't just work from home five days a week. That's obviously a much different situation than an employer who says, nope, everybody needs to be in the office five days a week. Um, so just something to think about, um, as I'm sure many of you have gotten these types of requests um, and we'll continue to get them going forward. Um, I think this is also an issue that we're probably going to start seeing uh, be litigated and actually the EEOC already filed um, uh, a lawsuit in the Northern District of Georgia that follows um, this kind of fact pattern. Um, so in that in this case, the um, employer placed its staff on modified work schedules. Um, they were allowed to work from home four days a week after the pandemic started in March of 2020. Um, but in June of 2020, the employer required all staff to return in person um, to in-person work at its facility five days per week. Um, and the employee who filed the lawsuit um, requested to continue working from home two days a week as an accommodation. She had heart conditions that increased her risk um, for uh, COVID-19. Um, the employer denied her request and two months later, um, uh, allegedly terminated her for performance related issues. Um, so this is the first case of this nature that the EEOC has filed. Um, unfortunately, there have been no substantive developments and it looks like the parties are gonna be heading to um, a mediation or a settlement conference sometime within the next week or so. Um, so, um, but we can probably expect to see um, some more cases um, of this nature in the next you know, few months or over the next year or two. Um, you know, as we continue to get um, requests to work from home as a reasonable accommodation. Okay. Um, implementing a remote workforce also raises jurisdictional concerns um, because remote employees may open employers to suit in foreign jurisdictions. So generally speaking, a court must find general or specific jurisdiction to confer jurisdiction upon an employer or company. Um, specific jurisdiction arises when a party has specific contacts with the forum state, and general jurisdiction arises when a party's affiliations with the forum state are continuous and, and systematic. So hypothetically speaking, a California corporation has a remote employee who works full-time in New Jersey. Assuming the facts and circumstances of the legal dispute are sufficient, can the California corporation be sued in New Jersey for employment discrimination associated with the employee's termination? And the answer is likely yes. Um, so uh, litigation in and of itself um, is, is a headache um, and it's an imposition on um, employer's business. Um, so if we're being hailed into court in foreign jurisdictions, um, you know, having to defend yourself elsewhere presents additional challenges of um, because witnesses and evidence are might be located in a different state. So um, just something else to be thinking of um, if you're considering implementing a more permanent remote or hybrid um, workforce that you know you might have to answer to lawsuits filed in states where your remote employees are working. Okay, keep in mind that there may also be paid leave requirements in the states where your employees are working. So. 10 states and the District of Columbia currently offer paid family and medical leave. Um, Maryland has passed a paid family leave law, but it's not yet up and running. Um, 16 states and the District of Columbia currently offer paid sick leave. And there are three states that um, offer paid parental leave for state employees. Um, most paid family leaves require payment into the program, similar to workers' compensation. So um, you need to ensure that you're paying into and providing applicable leaves if you have um, employees located in any of these states. Okay. Um, I assume we're all familiar with, with the FMLA and you know what it requires. Um, but one of the most challenging aspects um, of determining eligibility for leave under the FMLA is whether the employee is employed at a covered employer. Um, in other words, whether um, the employee works at a location where the employer has at least 50 employees within 75 miles. Um, the FMLA is silent on its applicability to remote workers. However, the US Department of Labor's implementing regulations state that for employees with no fixed work site, the work site is the site to which they are assigned as their home base, from which their work is assigned, or to which they report. Um, an employee's personal residence is not a work site in the case of employees who work from home 
as as with telework. Um, and so uh, when it comes to, to family medical leave, whether paid or unpaid or under state or federal law, um, employers should make sure that they understand the eligibility rules for their remote employees um, under federal and state law, which can sometimes conflict. Um, and in the case of the FMLA, it's important for employers to understand the workflow of the business and to track the various work sites for all employees, including remote ones. Um, there was recently a case filed in Texas um, and an employer was, the employer was denied summary judgment because there was a dispute of fact as to whether the plaintiff's work site was the employer's headquarters in Ohio, which did have more than 50 employees or in Texas where the plaintiff worked remotely. Um, the plaintiff's designated work site was Texas because that's where um, her supervisor was also working remotely. Um, but the facts suggested that the plaintiff's assignments actually came from um, the headquarters in Ohio, that she sent all of her um, reports and work product directly to headquarters in Ohio. They didn't get sent to her supervisor. And the supervisor didn't evaluate or really have any authority or ability to impact her employment status. Um, so employers need to be sure that you know the day-to-day -day facts um, aren't undermining any express designation regarding um, an employee's work site for purposes of um, FMLA eligibility. Um, many employers utilize restrictive covenants to protect their customers and business relationships from employees who go to work from competitors like wage and hour laws and anti-discrimination laws however the laws relating to restrictive covenants differ depending on the state law governing the dispute um, so for example washington dc just joined um, other states recently to prohibit to prohibit non-compete agreements except in very limited circumstances um, states such as illinois maryland nevada and virginia have passed laws prohibiting enforcing non-compete agreements against low-wage workers and hourly workers and colorado and oregon for example permit enforcement only in certain situations or against certain employees um, so it's important to be aware of those restrictions if you have employees located in these um, states. Ooh. To avoid trying to grapple with a mosaic of state laws in this area, employers may choose to include a governing law provision in their restrictive government agreement. So um, this means that the agreement would expressly state that it is to be interpreted and enforced pursuant to the laws of a specific state. Um, that said, however, this approach may not always be feasible as a court could find that despite such a provision, the applicable law should come from the state in which the employee resides, where the employee entered into the agreement, or where the employment relationship terminated. Um, so for example, California labor law prohibits, except in circum certain circumstances, um, employers from requiring an employee who primarily resides and works in California to agree to a provision that would require the employee to adjudicate, whether in arbitration or litigation, outside of California, a claim that arises in California. Um, and it also um, prohibits an employer from requiring or from depriving an employee of the substantive protection of California law with respect to a controversy arising in California. Um, so um, again, something to keep in mind that even though we may include these choice of law provisions in our um, in our restrictive government uh, covenant agreements, um, a court may not ultimately enforce them. Um, in addition to laws involving non-competition and non-solicitation agreements, there are changing state laws that limit employers' use of confidentiality and non-disclosure agreements. Um, the basis for these limitations is to ensure employees are protected against adverse action when speaking out about workplace conditions and treatment, particularly as it pertains to claims of sexual harassment. Um, some states prohibit signing this type of agreement as a condition of employment. Others also prohibit it um, when settling a um, uh, discrimination or retaliation claim that arises in the workplace. Um, employers in California should be mindful that a new law went into effect at the beginning of 22, 2022 with similar restrictions on non-disclosure agreements, such as barring confidentiality provisions that prevent an employee from disclosing information regarding all claims of harassment, discrimination, and retaliation, not just those involving sexual harassment. And Washington State also recently passed the Silence No More Act, which became in, uh, became effective in June of 2022. It has similar prohibitions. Um, 
employers cannot require employees to sign non-disclosure or non-disparagement agreements that would prevent an employee from discussing any alleged illegal mistreatment related to purported discrimination, harassment, and wage and hour violation. Um, this applies to the Washington law applies to all employers, regardless of size, um, and also to employees and independent contractors. So um, companies in uh, with employees uh, who are located in these states um, should be aware that you know these laws will, will require changes to many commonplace employment and independent contractor agreements, as well as um, you know severance and separation agreements, settlement agreements. So just uh, another um, issue to be aware of if you have employees located in these states. Um, employers with employees working rem working remotely in other states should also be aware that physical presence in a state via an employee can establish taxable ne nexus sufficient to for a state to justify taxation. And that next that nexus um, also permits a state or locality to impose a variety of taxes, um, including net income, gross receipts, net worth, or retail sales. Um, so employers should um, review employment tax requirements when remote employees live in jurisdictions where the employer does not currently have fi uh, filing obligations. And if an employee has connections with more than one state, um, employers should, should determine which states, um, there could be multiple, um, which can impose withholding obligations for those employees. Um, employers should review, I'm sorry, um, employers must also be aware of business registration requirements if they have employees working remotely from different states. Um, the failure to register your business um, can result in some pretty hefty fines, so that's um, really important to do. Um, employers need to pay into unemployment compensation in the correct state, and they need to ensure that their workers' compensation policies cover their remote workers. Um, in addition, the federal government and all state governments require employees to post certain information in a conspicuous location at their workplace. Each state has different requirements. Um, you know, this obviously becomes a little, um, not problematic, but uh, a little unclear if you only have one employee working from Maryland, for example. Um, and your headquarters is located in Pennsylvania. Obviously, there's no workspace in Maryland where the posters can be hung. Um, so I've seen employers, I've seen clients do it differently, um, a variety of different ways, whether it be, you know, distributing the, the required postings by email or posting them to, um, if the company has a internal intranet to which all employees have access, posting them there. Um, I think the bottom line is to double check that, you know, whatever you decide to do for your remote employees, that that's allowed by, um, you know, the state at issue. Um, employers must also uh, make sure that they're complying with state specific job posting requirements when managing a remote workforce. Um, So Colorado, for example, recently passed a new law which says that all job postings, including but not limited to promotions, must disclose the hourly or salary compensation or a range of hourly or salary compensation and a general description of all of the benefits and other compensation to be offered to the hired applicant. Um, so if your job posting could reach a Colorado resident, it must comply with this new wage transparency law by including the required salary and benefits information. Um, the Colorado Department of Labor has said that it's improper to carve out or exclude uh, Colorado residents from replying to the posting as a workaround um, the law. So in other words, you can't post something to, in to Indeed or wherever and say, you know, all remote employees except for those located in Colorado are encouraged to apply. Um, the Colorado Department of Labor is actively monitoring postings to ensure that they comply with the law. Um, to what extent is a little unclear, um, but they've been contacting employers who are not in compliance. And under the law, fines range from $300 to $10,000, with the higher fees reserved for those employers who are continually non compliant. Um, uh, as of March, um, we learned that if the, uh, the DOL had contacted an employer and the employer revised their posting to come into compliance, that the DOL had been waiving the fine. Um, I'm not sure if that's what they're still still doing a few months later, um, or if they will continue to do, to do that going forward. That may have just been their practice now uh, because the law was new at the time. Um, so that practice may change as time, time goes on. 
Um, And uh, New York also, um, New York City actually recently posted a similar law. So starting November 1, employers advertising jobs in New York City must include a good faith salary range for every job promotion, for every job promotion and transfer opportunity advertised. Um, the law applies to businesses with four or more employees where at least one person is working in New York City and it covers any job that can or will be performed at least partly in New York City, whether in office or remote work, part-time, full time interns or independent contractors. So um, this, this means um, uh, that the law applies to businesses located out, outside of the city that want to post job ads for remote work that could be done from anywhere in the US, including in New York City. Um, and like in Colorado, businesses that fail to um, fail to follow these requirements um, can, can face potential um, enforcement action by the city's Human Rights Commission, which can fine employers a maximum of um, $250,000 per violation. And this law also lets workers sue um, their current employers for violations. Um, so a little bit um, more uh, penalties um, in New York than in Colorado, but um, there are similar laws um, in the works in California and Washington state and um, New, and New York state. Um, so those are forthcoming. So keep an eye out um, for those laws as well. Okay. So, you know, it's without question that, that working from home is you know, the future of work. Um, so I just wanna spend a few final minutes discussing some best practices for implementing a remote workforce. Um, so it's really important to develop clear policies and expectations surrounding telework um, and to require employees who telework to execute a telework agreement. Um, a telework agreement should address what the expected hours of work are, um, what the expectations are for check-ins with uh, supervisors. Um, it should require employees to confirm that they have the appropriate equipment needed to perform their job duties. Um, and I did not include this as a separate slide, but um, you know, also be aware that there are certain jurisdictions such as California and um, DC and there's about seven or eight states um, that require um, employers to pay um, uh, under certain cir circumstances for um, you know, the tools and equipment that are necessary for remote employees to perform their job. Um, so to the extent that you um, must be providing um, tools and equipment to the employees, you need to be doing that as well. Um, the telework agreement should also um, set forth, you know, that there's a dedicated space um, within the employee's home where they'll be able to um, uh, perform their work without distraction, and that they'll be performing their work. Uh, that they will not be performing childcare. I'm sorry, childcare. I'm sorry. That they will be performing their work and not performing childcare during their hours of work. Um, the agreement should also. Um, include a confirmation that the work will be combined to one dedicated area because workers' compensation coverage is um, limited to this area. Um, it should also include a confirmation of appropriate high-speed um, secured internet. So these are just some things to think about um, for purposes of your um, telework agreements. Also, as I referenced earlier in the presentation, it's, it would also be a um, really important factor to include in your agreement is to have your employees confirm that they're going to be working from where they say they're going to be working. Um, you know, especially throughout the pandemic, um, you know, folks may have been, um, you know, located in Maryland, but decided, oh, you know, my, my parents or my grandparents or whomever live in Florida, I'm going to go down there and hang out with them and work from there for, for um, you know, three months or six months or whatever the case may be. Um, and, you know, doing so could, could, you know, open you up to exposure in a state where you don't previously have employees and weren't expecting to have employees. Um, so we want to make sure that, you know, employees are identifying where they're going to be working that, you know, that employers know where their employees are going to be working and that they commit to working in a specific location. Um, uh, and one final thing is that, you know, employees should confirm, you know, they should be using company equipment for company business. Um, in the uh, event that you have a hybrid work model where, um, you know, 
it, it's possible that um, the employee can come into the office. Um, you know, employees should be advised that telework may be revoked if they're not performing at an acceptable level or, you know, complying with the um, requirements of the telework agreement. So that's all I have for you today. Like I said um, at the beginning, it's you know kind of very high level issue spotting, just wanting everybody to be aware of some of the types of issues that you should be thinking about as you um, either currently have, or if you're considering going forward with a more permanent, either hybrid or fully remote or distributed workforce. Um, there's a lot, a lot to consider, um, a lot to think about. Um, and as Amy said, if anyone's interested in anything, um, any particular area, um, I'd be happy to come back and kind of, you know, do a deeper dive on any, any one or few particular issues, um, but wanted to make sure we kind of hit all the high spots in today's presentation um, so that everybody could kind of walk away um, with maybe some new things to be thinking about. I already have about like four or five different topics that I want you to cover next time. So I do think that we'll have to do another one of these. Cause like, yeah, there's just, there's so much to consider. Yeah. Um, we've got a bunch of questions. So I want to make sure we get to as many as possible. Um, do you have like a hard cutoff at one o'clock? Uh, no, two o'clock, no. Well, two o'clock for me. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, okay, cool. And, you know, if we don't get to any of these questions, we can definitely um, just write them out and include them in our follow up. So the first one I want to get to um, is from Betty. It says, what consideration regarding workspace should be implemented when dealing with sensitive or HIPAA sensitive information and others? who can be in the employee's uh, home workspace. So basically, how do you protect your information if it's sensitive in a space where other people might be? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I have a few things yeah. kind of bouncing around in my head. I mean, obviously that kind of goes back to um, one of the topics I talked about in terms of um, you know, making sure that your just general kind of cybersecurity, whatever, uh, um, you know, software that you already use to make sure that that's kind of in place and um, applicable to a remote worker. Um, uh, and again, making sure that folks are, um, you know, as part of their telework agreement, like build that into the telework agreement to make sure that folks are, um, you know, agreeing to abide by those um, those requirements. Um, I'm sure I'm not uh, you know, a healthcare or HIPAA expert, but I'm sure um, attorneys who specialize in those fields might have more specific um, recommendations um, because they live and breathe that every day. But sure. I would say, again, just making sure that you have those, you know, your own um, security procedures in place and, and, and making sure that employees are complying with them. Okay, yeah, um, I know that there's a lot that goes into HIPAA information. This is kind of one related um, that got uh, emailed over. How do you confirm that the work area is safe and working without distractions such as small children? Yeah, that's a, that's a hard one because you, you know, you're not gonna be calling your employee every five minutes or every hour to say, you know, can I hear something going on in the background? Um, again, I think it's just building that into the telework agreement and having employees confirm that that they're you know that they're going to have a dedicated space that they that there aren't going to be distractions. I mean, you know, obviously you can get a sense for that when you're zooming with people and you you know people say, oh, you know, sorry, uh, you know, my my baby's here. I just had a witness interview last week and she said, I'm sorry if my baby wakes up, you know, I might have to step away or. Um, mm -hmm. You can hear people's dogs or I've had, you know, sometimes people, you know, knocking on my door or what have you, um, and you can hear that. Um, so you might get a sense for that too, just by having conversations with folks um, via Zoom or Teams or whatever platform that you use. Um, and so I think it's, yeah, that's kind of a harder one, you know, to, to nail down in terms of whether employees are doing that or not. But again, I think it's building it into, um, into a policy, into an agreement so that if it becomes clear that an employee is, you know, watching their child for two hours a day that, you know, they can be appropriately disciplined for that. If, you know, those pattern. Yes, yeah. exactly. 
Yeah. Yeah. Cause I know, I mean, I have a four-year-old who's in preschool and she's in the public school system here in Chicago and they have a lot of days off and I obviously work from home. So it's, it's, it's hard to juggle that, but I think that if those things happen every once in a while, obviously it's probably not an issue, but if it's yeah. starting to become a pattern. Yeah, it happens. Um, and also, sorry, not to cut you off, but again, yeah. that's kind of where, you know, everything is so interrelated, but that's also where, you know, um, the idea of a wellness day or a personal day or PTO kind of comes in too, that, you know, maybe you, uh, a way to counterbalance that is to build in, um, and maybe you would title it something else um, um, and not necessarily PTO, but building in extra time off. So like in the example that you just said, if there's a kind of unexpected school closure that employees can, you know, take a day off without, you know, any sort of repercussion to, to care for a child if they need to and aren't being placed in a position where they're trying to, to balance the two and, you know, maybe not focusing as much on work as they should be. Sure, that makes sense. Um, I, I don't know if you know the answer to this. I, I'm just wondering myself. You mentioned like doing during your Zoom calls, you can kind of just witness what what is space you know people are working in their areas. Are you allowed to um, to require people to have their cameras on? Do you know during meetings, like during team meetings and stuff? I mean, there's no legal requirement that I'm aware of that says you have to have your camera on, but you know, I'm just wondering if you're allowed. It can be, certainly it can be a matter of company policy. If you want to build that into your policies and procedures, there's nothing that says that you can't do that. Um, and maybe it's not for every meeting, maybe it's for certain high level meetings, or maybe it's, you know, just for the weekly team check in or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, I mean, certainly you can implement that requirement because, you know, it's not only for kind of checking pe people's surroundings, um, that sounds a little sleuthy, but, you know, it's also that's a big um, has a big impact on team morale and engagement. 100%. You know, if you're just staring at a black screen on Zoom all day, like that's just not, it's not very engaging. Um, and especially if you have folks where everyone's working remotely, it's just a wave so you can see your coworkers and engage and interact. And, you know, Amy and I had a little back and forth about the holidays when we hopped on before this started, you know, those types of organic conversations where you get to know people. I mean, I have that when somebody comes to my door and drops by and says, hey, how was your Thanksgiving? But, you know, doing that on Zoom, it's, it's a little harder when people are remote. So I think requiring people to be um, in person, I'm sorry, on camera, maybe not, I mean, all the time, sure, but maybe not all the time, but at least requiring, way. yeah, requiring it at least to a certain extent. Um, I think that's also really important too. It just helps foster that, that camaraderie, that, that sense of collegiality that you will, you don't otherwise have because you don't have a physical workspace that you're all working from. Totally. Um, this next one says, what is the best practice for terminating an employee who you suspect their poor performance is due to not working? I know that that's a very big question. Um, if you have a high level answer or, you know, maybe that is something that we go into detail about on the next one. It's up to you. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, that's kind of hard to answer in a vacuum because, it, you know, everybody hates lawyers for saying this, but it always, it depends and it's always case specific, but it always, it, it always is. Um, you know, again, I think it goes back to, um, I think that's hard too, because it's, you know, does the employee, it's hard to measure performance, remote performance. If, you know, is this an employee who's always been working remotely? So you don't know what else they may or may not be capable of, or is this somebody who was in the office and then, you know, was working remotely and now their performance seems to be slipping, you know, like, do you have anything else to judge it against? Um, and so, you know, that obviously would be, be a consideration. Um, I think high level would be, you know, just making sure again, it's harder when you're not, when you're not in person, you're not having those organic check-ins or, you know, potentially like, you know, 
not, I don't want to use counseling in the sense of discipline, but really just kind of like talking about the work. You're not really having those conversations as organically when you're working remotely. So I think it's important to be having those check-ins with employees and talking about performance. Don't leave it until the end of the year or don't certainly don't skip it. You know, you need to be following up and kind of documenting things as, as it go, goes along and, and keeping a record and, and seeing if there are any patterns um, that develop. Well, that's what I was going to say. I think that documentation, obviously, we all know that that's so important to document everything, but I think it can fall to the wayside a little bit when you're not in the office or when you're not in person. Um, so just keep it, just, just make sure that you would document everything like you would if you were in person and all together. And I know for us, all of us are, are remote now. We totally got rid of our office space last October. So it's been over a year. We do a, at least one weekly check-in that's just always on the calendar. And it really has made such a big difference with morale and just mm -hmm. like working together because we don't have, we can't stop in each other's offices anymore. So it really has gone a long way. Yeah. And I think building that into management's, um, you know, job duties into their schedule so that they're setting aside whatever, the, whatever the time is, depending on how many direct reports they have. Um, but building that into your job duties that, okay, I'm going to, at the end of the week, I'm going to sit down and reflect for 30 minutes on things that may have happened and jot down notes about, you know, Joe, Bob and Sally who report to me um, and what was good, what was bad so that you're, you know, continually monitoring those things. Um, so, so I know we have a couple more questions in here. Uh, we're not going to obviously get be able to get to all of them, and some of them are are pretty um, specific. So I will just I'll download these and um, I'll work with Courtney to answer whatever we can, and then I'll Great. include them in the follow up. But I do just have like one last question about that. Um, would you if you're if you're documenting something that's happened a performance issue and you have to i don't know even if you don't write the person up but you have to document it what would be the best practice to relay that information to the person to the employee and get sign off on uh, on it from them so that they're aware that there's a problem just in case you have to terminate them in the future is it okay um, to do that stuff digitally, like email or, you know, signing it, you know, in, in a in a PDF on online or, you know, whatever. Do you have best practices for those things? Yeah, I think, you know, certainly, you know, having a, a conversation via Zoom or Teams or whatever it is, you know, instead of bringing somebody into your office, which you might do to have that conversation, you would do it virtually. Um, you know, if you have a document prepared, you can obviously show your, your you know, your screen like we did today um, and kind of walk them through that. But yeah, I think um, sending it to them um, electronically is, is fine, asking them to sign and return it to you. I mean, a lot of us are aware that, um, you know, frequently employees don't like to, to sign off on discipline because they think it means that they're agreeing with everything that you've said in the counseling or the written discipline, and they might not necessarily agree. So I know a lot of times folks don't sign, and that might be the case. Folks might not sign, and, you know, that's fine. At least you've done the documentation, done your due diligence for, for the file. But, yeah, I think sending it electronically is um, perfectly fine. Um, and, you know, sharing it electronically so that, you know, that they're able to see it and walking them through the same way that you would if they were sitting in your office. Okay. That makes sense. All right. This, this was so awesome. Thank you so much for going over all of these with us. And, um, you know, I know that we're going to have a, a lot more um, things to talk about. So we will work out those details, but thank you Great. so much, Courtney, for yeah. coming. I hope you have a great holiday season. And um, everybody, we will we are doing we're doing our next webinar on um, December twentieth. I'm going to open registration up for that really soon. So keep your eye out for those emails. And thank you so much for coming, everyone. Thank have you, a good day, Courtney. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.